Hey guys, happy Wednesday. Hope your week is going well so far, and thank you for joining us for part 21 of our series here in the Gospel of Matthew, as we've been looking at the discipleship principles of Jesus as we see them in the Gospel of Matthew. So it hasn't been a verse-by-verse or word-by-word study of Matthew, but more looking at it through the lens of what does the life and ministry of Jesus teach us about what discipleship looks like. And so today we are in Matthew chapter 11. Uh, We'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. And as we turn there, let's pray. Lord, thank you for a new day that we can open up your word and allow your living word to speak into our hearts. And Father, we pray that we would be open and receptive to what it is that you want to deposit within our souls by your Spirit, show us how you want to apply us to apply this to how we live our lives. And Lord, may we live out what we see, not in our strength or our power, because we will fail. But may we walk and live in the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us. And as I said, we are in Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 1, where it says, When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, I remember as we look back through chapter 10, Jesus sending out his disciples uh, to go and proclaim the kingdom of God, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. And he gives them a lot of instruction about what that's going to look like, about how there's going to be opposition, there's going to be resistance, and they should expect that, but they should keep their eyes on eternity, keep their eyes on Jesus, and not allow the circumstances to discourage them or weigh them down. And so he finishes instructing his 12 disciples, and he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. So as he sends them out, Jesus goes and continues his ministry of preaching and teaching from town to town. In verse 2, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, just taking a second here to think about John the Baptist, who, remember, John's ministry from birth was to be the forerunner of the Messiah, was to proclaim that the Messiah was near, that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, that people should repent and believe the gospel. And But here John is, he's been imprisoned for his preaching, he's gotten himself into trouble, and he gathers some of his disciples together and has them send a message to Jesus, asking a question. And the question is, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And it's a very interesting question that John asks. Again, here, John is facing inevitable death and asking the question of Jesus. And you think about everything that John experienced with Jesus, everything he saw concerning Jesus. I mean, he was there at the baptism of Jesus when the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and and God speaks Uh, over him, and he's there for that, but yet he still has this moment of saying, just ask him again. Make sure that I've given my life for the right reason, that I I haven't given up my life for the sake of an imposter, because there were multiple imposters, uh, people claiming to be the Messiah who were not, and John saying, I just want to know, as I give up my life for Jesus, that he is, in fact, the Christ. And so he sends his disciples with that question, are you the one or shall we look for another? So verse 4, Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So, It's interesting what Jesus gives as the proof that he's Messiah. Now, notice he doesn't say to John, how dare you ask that? Or you man of weak faith, how can you second guess now after all of this time? He understands his doubt. He understands his need for clarity. And he sends John's disciples back with this account. Now, Jesus could have gone through all of the scriptures, all the prophecies of Messiah and how he fulfilled them. Rather... He simply tells them this, go and tell John, in the name of Jesus, blind people are receiving their sight. Lame people are now walking. 
Lepers are being cleansed. The the deaf are beginning to hear. The dead are being raised. Uh, The poor have good news preached to them. So this is the proof that Jesus gives. Look at the fruit of my ministry. Again, it's not about, can, can Jesus quote enough scripture to validate that he's the Messiah? He's simply saying, look at the evidence, the fruit of my life and my ministry, and let that speak for itself. And I love that because I, I think it does set a pattern that we see in the life and ministry of Jesus that his preaching of the kingdom and his demonstration of the kingdom go hand in hand. And we've seen this principle before in the book of Matthew because Matthew is really focused on Jesus as the king. But we also see this on display in the book of Acts where we see the demonstration of the gospel and the preaching of the gospel going hand in hand. And my prayer for us in our day is that we would come back to seeing this balance of the proclamation of the gospel and the demonstration of the gospel, the demonstration of the kingdom going hand in hand. I know that it's very easy to say, well, all of that stuff stuff stopped. Uh, at a certain point in history, and that's no longer valid for today, but I see no biblical reason to adopt that. I see no historical reason to adopt that. Rather, we, we see everything Jesus does, everything that happens in the book of Acts, and we see scripture declaring that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. The same Holy Spirit that was with Jesus is with us. The same Holy Spirit that was with the apostles is with us. Nothing has changed. And I think what's happened is because we don't see a lot of miraculous things, because we don't see blind receiving their sight, we don't see the lame walking, we don't see lepers being cleansed, we don't see the deaf hearing, we don't see the dead raised up, we make a theology out of it to let ourselves off the hook rather than say, Lord, why is it we see this so abundantly in the Gospels? We see this so abundantly in the book of Acts. We see accounts of this abundantly throughout church history. Lord, what stopped? And I have to look in my own heart to say, Lord, what what is blocking the working of your spirit through me to continue on this kingdom ministry? And so I'm praying that we would see a renewal in our day of not only a proclamation of the kingdom, because I I believe that we've come to a point, especially in our culture, where they've heard enough proclamation of the kingdom. They've heard the preachers. They've heard the gospel. Although that's becoming less and less. Uh, I spent a lot of time in street ministry, and especially among uh, those under the age of 30. It's amazing to me how many of them have no idea who Jesus is. No idea what Jesus has done. No idea of the gospel. Uh, Many of them are being raised in atheist and agnostic homes, and and they're not getting that basic teaching of Jesus that many of us took for granted as we were being raised. And they're growing up in an entirely different culture. But still there are so many. And in those days of street ministry, I can't tell you the number of times an atheist or agnostic, you know, we can talk all day long. We can go back and forth all day long about the validity of the gospel, but it always came down to one thing. Show me. If what you're saying is true, show me. And I think this is the vital lack in the church of Jesus Christ today, because we see it in the gospels. We see Jesus proclaiming the kingdom. We see Jesus demonstrate the kingdom. In the book of Acts, they declare the kingdom. They demonstrate the kingdom. And I think what we're lacking now is all we have is a proclamation of the kingdom. And we're seeing very little demonstration of the kingdom of God. And I want to step in and say, Lord, blow the doors off of the little room that I've compartmentalized everything in. And you be God. You do what you want to do. Just let me be a vessel that you can work through to not only tell people the reality of the kingdom, to tell people about the gospel, but to show them, to see how you work in people's lives, to see you transform lives, to see you do the impossible, to see you do the miraculous in the hearts and lives of people. So this is the account that Jesus sends back to John the Baptist. I think there's a call for us as disciples of Jesus in our day, to step into this heritage. To say, Lord, there is no reason for me 
to buy into the mentality that you don't do this anymore. There's none. I mean, we could try to play gymnastics with Scripture to show that it doesn't happen, but ultimately it's just that. It's gymnastics because we still see accounts. Now, granted, when we see accounts today, we see a lot of abuses. We see some very bizarre things, and so we tend to just want nothing to do with it. But the appropriate way to deal with abuse isn't to not use at all. The appropriate response to misuse is proper use, to allow a proper demonstration of the reality of the kingdom of God, to see all of the stuff that we read about in Scripture, to see it lived out among us. And I want to invite us as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, to begin to earnestly cry out to God and say, Lord, do today what you did in the Gospels. Lord, do today what you did in the book of Acts. Lord, do today what you have done throughout church history, but we've seen lacking in our day. And that is not only a proclamation of the kingdom, a proclamation of the gospel, but a demonstration of the reality of the kingdom of God to see the power of God working through his people to transform the lives of those around us. So I need to cut just a little bit short today. I apologize for that, but want to thank everyone who uh, joined in uh, live and for those who are watching later. But again, just want to invite us to go back to the Gospels, to go back to the book of Acts, to go back and read accounts through church history of miracles, of healings, of God doing tremendous works among his people, and to cry out in desperation to say, Jesus, do it again. Lord, do it in our day. Do it in our midst. That the world wouldn't just hear us talk about the gospel, but the world would see the demonstration of the kingdom among us. Let's pray. Lord, would you do again what you've done for so long? Would you work through your people in power to demonstrate the reality of your kingdom so that our preaching and our demonstration would go hand in hand to testify the truth of who you are? So Lord, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your power and work through us to reach this world in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, Lord willing, we will join together next week uh, for our next part as we continue through this look through the Gospel of Matthew. So thank you again. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.